Welcome to the AUA Inside Track podcast. Today's Inside Track podcast is part of the Meet the Subspecialty series and is brought to you by the Residents and Fellows Committee. Dr. Christopher Corbett, urology resident at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis, sits down with Dr. Molly Fuchs, a pediatric urologist at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio, to explore the subspecialty of pediatric urology. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Chris Corbett. I'm currently a third year resident at the University of Minnesota. For today's AUA Inside Track podcast, we will be continuing with the Meet the Subspecialties series with today's focus being on pediatric urology. Today we have with us uh, Dr. Molly Fuchs from Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Uh, She received her medical degree from OHSU and then went on to complete her residency training at the University of Utah. Uh, she then continued on to Nationwide Children's Hospital to complete fellowship training in pediatric urology. Uh, notably, uh, as has been seen uh, recently on the Twitter sphere, uh, she recently received this year's teaching award in the urology department at Nationwide Children's Hospital as well. So thank you very much, Dr. Fuchs, for uh, joining us today. Thanks for having me. Um, just uh, to get started with some questions then. So uh, first, uh, what led you to pursue a career in pediatric urology? Yeah, so um, I think the biggest influence on my career choice, um, for the most part, was really the mentors that I've been privileged to work with um, along the way. I don't think many people, um, when you ask them as a kid what they want to do with their life, say they want to be a pediatric urologist. So I think for most of us, it's um, you meet people along the way that um, kind of show you the light and let you see what a great field it is. Um, And honestly, I decided on urology a little late in the game. Um, I actually, when I decided to apply to medical school, my plan was to become a developmental pediatrician and work with kids with developmental disabilities. Um, So anyone that knows me now probably finds that hard to believe um, because it's just so different than what I do. But uh, my career plans changed pretty quickly once I got some experience in the hospital environment and found um, the operating room and just felt like that was really where um, I wanted to be and where I belonged. Um, in medical school, for a long time, I tried to do anything except urology because um, I'm the daughter of a urologist. So I um, considered everything else other than it. And when I couldn't really find anything that um, suited what I wanted, one of my dad's residents actually told me, um, she said, don't not do urology because of him. And I thought that was really eye-opening. And so I did an elective rotation at the VA um, in urology with her and some of her other residents. And it completely um, opened my eyes to the field and I just loved it. Um, so I really credit her to um, sort of exposing me to urology, even though I lived in a house with a urologist my whole life. Um, you know, her and uh, she and the other residents really are the ones that exposed it, uh, me to it, which was great. Um, and even though I did a, a pediatric urology re- rotation as a fourth year med student for a whole month, it really wasn't anything I ever really considered. Um, then I was fortunate to match it at Utah, um, which really influenced my career path greatly. Um, uh, we were a, a small program at the time. We only had two residents, but our faculty had really expanded. So we had a ton of operative experience. We are a really busy program. Um, and we do a two, true general surgery year with only one month of peds uh, urology thrown in. That's the only urology experience we had. And even then, I, I don't even really think I considered it. Um, it just, I thought I was gonna do oncology. I loved big cases and um, big open stuff. And that's just sort of what I always thought I would do. Um, and then I got to my third year and I did my peds rotation. And even then it wasn't really on my radar. I don't really know how I came to it, but. Um, we did three month, two three-month blocks, and um, we had six pediatric urologists at Utah, really busy service, um, and we jokingly called it surgery camp because you operate most of the day. The attendings are really great to work with, um, and that's when I started to realize how great PEDS was, um, the variety at which uh, of cases you get to see, um, the personalities that are in PEDS are usually really, really great, really easy to get along with. Um, and the pediatric urologists in Utah were wonderful. They had high expectations of us. They held us accountable. Um, we were asked a lot of questions and expected to be well read on all topics. Um, and I can still remember a series of questions that would be asked to me during a hypospadias case and um, just paralyzing fear. But we had really, really great mentorship that exposed me to it. And that really influenced me a lot. Um, 
and then I switched to a different rotation and realized peds was really what I liked. Um, and so when I went back um, to my next peds rotation, it really stuck. And I thought this is exactly what I want to do. Um, and it was just, it kind of was my path. Um, I remember when trying to decide on peds, I asked one of my mentors, Dr. Cartwright, how he decided. And it surprised me that he said that he thought about doing oncology, which is what I thought I would do. And I said, well, how did you choose? And he said, well, I felt like oncology was always doing a templated surgery the same way every time and basically just taking things out. But in pediatrics, the challenge was to use the tissue that you have and try to make it work. And it's a very creative process. And to this day, I remember him telling me that. I remember exactly where I was because it made such a profound impact on me and the way I think about peds. Um, and I think it's really the best thing about ped urology. It's different every single day, the variety that you get to do. Um, you can have a full day of cirques and hernias, or you can do a big robotic case. You can do a big reconstruction case. Um, and I just think that's, that's just the greatest thing about it. So that's kind of my journey on how I came to it. Um, and I've kind of never, never looked back. Sounds great. Was creativity always uh, something you, you had it growing up as well that, that led you to that? Or was that sort of a newfound, newfound area? Yeah, I don't know that I was ever very creative, but I did always like working with my hands and, and um, kind of building things and, and doing things like that. Um, still do. Um, and I think, yeah, it was just sort of, I think more so than creativity, I, I like puzzles and problems and, and being a problem solver, I guess. Um, and that to me is, is the challenge every day um, in reconstructive urology or, you know, reconstructive urology is very similar to peds and, and I do a lot of peds reconstruction and um, you know, you kind of say, okay, this is, this is what we have and this is where we need to get, how are we going to do that? And how, how are we going to use the tissue we have and balance the risks and benefits of all the different options we have to create something that's going to work for a child and hopefully work their whole life. Um, that's sort of the other dynamic within peds. That's a challenge is that you're creating a, a man-made or woman-made product that has to try to be durable. And that's always a bit of the challenge. I guess build, hopefully building off of that then. So what, what are some of the uh, most satisfying parts of your job and, and what are some of the most challenging aspects of your job that are unique to pediatric urology? Yeah. So the, I mean, the satisfying parts, obviously surgery is great. I love operating. It's, it's fun every day. Working with the trainees is great, but, but really the, the reason you kind of come back every day and the reason you find, or I find value and, and satisfaction in my job, no question is the relationship with families and, and patients. A lot of kids in pediatrology you'll see just once or twice before and after surgery, but others you have really long, meaningful relationships with. And, um, you know, we really are kind of the luckiest people in the world to have families allow us to operate on their kids. Um, these parents meet you once or twice and they entrust you with the care of their child. And it's their baby, whether it's their baby or their 17-year-old baby, because that's how their parents always see them. And um, that relationship with families is really important. Um, it's really, it's really special. Um, and I think that's, it's something that gets overlooked a little bit, maybe in adult urology, but in peds, it's, it's sort of in your face all the time. And one specific scenario that I find the most, um, it's sort of my favorite case, um, is when I'm doing a continent bladder reconstruction in a neurogenic bladder patient. So for, you know, myelomeningocele or spina bifida. And these are usually kids that I've followed since they were babies for years. And we sort of go through this process of how to keep their bladder safe. And they're either in diapers and can't potty train, or they're on intermittent catheterization. And you get to know them throughout the years. And then eventually when they're five or six, they graduate to this phase of ready to be out of diapers. And that's usually a pretty big operation. It's, you know, six hours plus or minus, uh, probably a week in the hospital. And um, it's, a discussion I don't take lightly. I spend about an hour with families to talk to them about it. I bring it up multiple times throughout their life. And eventually they come to me and they say, okay, we're ready. And, and it really feels like um, a really exciting time with them. It's stressful because it's a big operation with complications and the family's nervous and stressed, but um, it's really rewarding because 
you see these kids back and they're independent, they're confident, um, you know, that it really, it really changes their lives. And to me, that's just such a, a fun part um, of their life I get to be a part of. Um, and it's, it's just so rewarding. Um, I also certainly satisfying work with my partners. We have a really collaborative group. We do combination cases together across specialties within our group. Um, and that's just, it's a great, almost like a team environment that I really, um, really enjoy. It's, it's just wonderful. Um, challenging aspects. There's a million of those, but I think one of the big challenges, um, that's not unique to pediatric urology um, is dealing with complications, but it does hit a little bit differently when it's kids. Um, it's hard because you're dealing with the child and their whole family dynamic for better or worse. It could be a good thing or a bad thing. There's a lot of emotions involved. Um, so that can be really challenging. Um, but also it's hard sometimes when a kid could have a bad outcome or have deterioration of their renal function or recurrent UTIs because of something out of their control. Sometimes parents aren't able to take care of their kids well. There's difficult home situations. Um, so that's something that I think is really difficult to see because in adult urology, it feels a little bit more like it's, oh, they're adults, it's, they're part of this decision. But when it's kids that are helpless, that, that can weigh on people a little bit. And I think that can be a bit of a challenge. Speaking, I mean, just now as a resident from, you know, when we have complications, I, I can only imagine I can only imagine what it's like with it with a child too. So, and I, I, I bet it must be hard when they start to graduate on to their adult providers and, and age out of the pediatric system as well. Is that absolutely how, how that go? that's a, that's a challenge in a lot of ways. Um, mostly because we don't have a lot of adult providers that um, want to see these patients. So we actually continue at our hospital to see these patients. Transitional urology is, um, one, it's a little bit of a buzzword and we use it probably inappropriately a lot of times. Um, I think a lot of times it's used in the sense of when we are ready to transition patients rather than when patients are really truly ready to transition because the peds world's really different than the adult world. Um, you know, we have social workers that call families if they miss appointments. Um, in an adult hospital, if they miss an appointment, they just miss it. Um, there's no one sort of making sure that these, these kids are getting taken care of because and a lot of the diagnoses that I take care of, even though they're 18, cognitively, they may not be an adult. Um, and so that can be a big challenge. So transitional care or creating appropriate transitional um, care centers is really critical. Um, we don't currently have that at our hospital within urology. We'd like to have it, but um, places that have great transitional programs, um, uh, I mean, that's completely invaluable. Um, because I worry a lot about these kids as they, they leave my care or my partner's care, um, whether or not they're going to continue to do well, because it's hard. It's, it's a big challenge once you get out there in the adult world to remember to keep your appointments and remember to take care of yourself. So I, I worry about that a lot. So at our hospital, we continue to see them as long as they need us. But um, there's challenges with that certainly as well. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, the the patient being ready to transition versus the provider, I think is, is a very important thing for us probably to all keep in mind for, you know, everything. So that's, that's great. Um, yeah, absolutely. What do you see changing most about the field of pediatric urology going forward? Well, I think certainly a lot has changed in the last 10 years, probably 10 years. Um, for example, you know, when I was a resident, I, we didn't have a robot for peds. So I never had seen a robotic pediatric case ever. Um, and then I came to Nationwide and, you know, fast forward, what, seven, eight years later, and almost, you know, I probably do half of my reconstructive cases robotically. So certainly minimally invasive surgery has uh, changed a lot. We certainly don't do everything um, robotically, which I, I think is a good thing. I think open surgery is still great. Um, I'm a little bit fearful that with some of the legislation that's out there that is trying to ban surgery on the genitalia, um, our field could really change a lot in the future. I'm hopeful it won't happen, but I think um, within our field, that's always a concern. Um, I, I do think one thing that hasn't changed and probably won't change is the amount of open surgery that we do in PG urology. We do quite a bit of minimally invasive, but in general still, you know, 
most of our procedures are open. It's technical. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of real deal surgery, not, not endoscopic or lap, like a lot of specialties are, but you know, most of our residents really like doing peds because it's when they really get good open experience, um, which I think is great. Um, I do think the field of pediatric urology has, um, become a little bit less popular uh, for whatever reason. I think probably because of the um, popularity of the reconstructive fellowship. Um, so it's too bad because we need more people interested in doing reconstruction in pediatrology. So hopefully that'll improve, but um, certainly applicant numbers have been down in the last several years. Um, and we'd like to see that improve. Maybe to, maybe to give future potential applicants an idea of what they're getting themselves into. Uh, what, what's a typical week look like for your practice in terms of clinic, operative volume, you know, research and teaching obligations? Sure. So my practice is probably a little bit unique um, compared to others. Um, I, I do two, pretty much two days of clinic a week and two days in the OR a week on average. Now, some weeks may differ. And then usually I have one day a week um, where we do conferences with residents and fellows. Um, I have some administrative time where we may do prenatal consults or um, other meetings, catching up on charting and stuff. Um, that's also the research time that I have dedicated because I don't, I don't have protected research time as, as most people don't. Um, so I try to catch up on research on those days. Um, and a typical OR day could be a day of eight to 10 circumcisions and hernias, could be some hypospadias, or it could be, you know, big robotic cases. Um, it, it's really varied. Um, a typical clinic um, in my practice is about 25 to 30 patients. You're probably booking eight to 10 surgeries in that day uh, for the most part. It's a lot of new patients, a lot of kind of, you have a problem, I can fix it. This is what we do. Boom, boom, boom. Um, or um, intermixed in there might be some patients I've seen for years and years and have chronic issues that I've been following. Um, so really a wide variety, really varied. I also um, run our myelomeningocele clinic on Friday mornings um, with our fellow and our nurse practitioner and also do our um, colorectal clinic uh, one to two days a month. So I'm kind of all over the place. Um, now that's not what every pediatrologist do. Uh, so, so some pediatrologists do um, only small cases, only ambulatory cases, and never even think about doing a bladder augmentation. Um, probably the vast majority um, do that. And then there's others that do half adult, half kids. Um, some do, you know, half research. Um, it's the, the look of a pediatric urologist is actually uh, quite varied when you look all across the country. Um, but that's typically what my day looks like. Thank you for sharing. What advice or recommendations would you give someone considering a career in pediatric urology? Um, I think first of all, um, and this is mostly coming from things that I always heard in residency, um, don't be afraid of the parents. I remember hearing a lot of people say, oh, I don't want to do peds because then you have to deal with parents. Or they'd say, oh, it's like veterinary medicine because the patient can't tell you what's wrong. Um, and that's just not, not true. <laughs> um, I, I've never really felt that way. And I always felt that parents um, are a challenge, but oftentimes only because they're scared and they just need some time and want to be heard. And um, sometimes that means sitting and listening to them for a while and maybe not having a solution for them. Um, and, and usually that time you invest in listening to them will pay dividends later on because they, they know that you care and they know you want to help their child. Um, but I think uh, parents can get a bad rap. <laughs> and maybe out now that I am a parent, I'm a little bit more sensitive to it. But um, I think that that was always something I heard kind of buzzing around when I was a resident and even a fellow that how challenging parents can be. But um, I just took a step back and thought, you know, they, they're just scared um, and they just don't, don't quite know what, what to do and they need some help. Um, specifically to people who want to do peds, um, you know, make contact with other pediatric urologists as much as you can. We're a really small field. We all know each other. Um, we all talk, we, you know, we all like having people who are interested in our fields and, um, 
you know, some people don't get a lot of pediatric exposure in their residency program. And that's, uh, that's a shame for most people. Um, and like I was saying, you know, a lot of people don't even consider pediatrics because it is so vastly different from adult urology. Um, so unless you really have good mentors and good exposure, you won't even consider it. So if you can present at a pediatric meeting or just go to one of the pediatric meetings, um, you know, I think the AUA is working hard at some mentorship programs to try to hook people up with mentors within the same field. I think that's a great idea and a great opportunity to get to know people. Um, And then when you're applying for fellowships, try to go somewhere that's high volume um, because, you know, this is, it's your one opportunity to really see it all and do it all. You'll continue working um, and learning once you're done, but fellowship's so important and go somewhere where, um, you know, that supports you and mentors you to become who you want to be as a PGRologist. And, um, you know, there's, like I said, there's such a wide variety of what your c- career can look like. Go somewhere that's going to support you and help you kind of find your way and all that. Um, I think that's, that's really important. Um, and, you know, there's all kinds of different fellowships and there's kind of a fit for everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, most of us really just want to help you become the best version of, of you that you can be. Hey, uh, g- going back to the, the, uh, the point about parents and, and the concerns with them, I think that's, uh, it, it's very true. I think, especially seeing, you know, that they're coming from a place usually of unconditional love and fear and concern. And, and it's very, very easy to forget that. But also once you remind yourself, it's very easy to, I think, be forgiving in those situations. So it's a, a, hopefully a good point that everyone takes away from, from this conversation. So, uh, I, one last question, um, how do you go about, you know, speaking to some of the frustrations with parents about dealing and addressing challenging topics, you know, when parents are asking about antibiotics or, you know, more concerning topics like circumcision, you know, as, you know, some of the legislation could change in the future, but also, you know, when, how those conversations with parents go and how you address those. Sure. I think a lot of this is um, probably a bit of a style uh, point, I guess. And it's just the style that I have with families. Um, I, I usually use a lot of shared decision-making and I tell them my role is not necessarily to tell you uh, what to do, but to tell you the options and to talk about the risks and benefits of all of them. Um, I don't really like the paternalistic role of telling someone how we should treat something. Um, In my opinion, it's more of a discussion and a conversation. And um, we try to figure out what, Um, parents' values are and what their fears are. Um, Some families want to avoid surgery at all costs. Others just kind of want to have their problem fixed and be done. Um, And I I think understanding where a family's coming from and asking them what their biggest concern is, what are they most scared of, I, I think that allows you to kind of understand them more and be able to help make that decision with them, not necessarily for them. Um, I use this way of talking to families a lot when it comes to that example I gave you about a continent reconstruction um, for kids with spina bifida, because that's a really important time. Um, You know, all kids want to be out of diapers. It makes sense, right? But they may not fully understand what it takes to do that. And they may not be ready for the responsibility of cathing every three hours, irrigating, um, you know, there's, it's, it's like a full-time job taking care of their bladder sometimes. And sure, it sounds great to be in underwear and dry, but they may not be quite ready for that. So the way I navigate that is I sit down with the family and I give them all the options, including staying in diapers, intermittent catheterization, um, a continent diversion, all the way to an incontinent diversion um, with a bag. And we discuss all the options. And, and I think that's, it's really important that they know all the options And then they also take a little bit more ownership of the decision. And also um, they, they work, they understand the work it takes to maintain their bladder when they're done and and prevent complications. And ultimately your relationship with that patient in making that decision is going to create a much more successful environment for everyone involved. And I think it, it feels more rewarding to everyone when you do come to that decision Um, and everyone sort of feels heard and that you've made a decision that's right, right for their kid. And, and, you know, you think is safe. Um, and if something needs to be an, I'll tell them, but most of the time in what I do, there's not a right or wrong answer. There's just a right answer for that person, um, and that child. And so we talk about it and it's a bit time consuming, but I, I think, 
Um, at least for me, it's worked really well. And I've been really happy with the conversations I've been able to have with families about that. Great. Thank, thank you for, uh, for sharing. Definitely take some of that advice with uh, future interactions. So um, anything else that you, you know, you'd like to share any parting words of advice or, or wisdom or. Um, pediatric urology is the best and everyone should do it. <laughs> um, no, I mean, we're a really unique field. Um, we're one of the only fields or subspecialties within urology that is, like I said, is completely different. I mean, right now you're about to start your fourth year. Can you imagine a week in your life where you never looked at or thought about a prostate? I mean, it feels so crazy, right? But that's, we rarely do. And we rarely deal with cancer. Um, it's, it's really a, a really unique field. You can't do it without the foundations you get from your urology residency. You use that every single day. Um, but it is this kind of fun little subset of urology that's, that's really different and really unique, um, creative and technically challenging. Um, but it's, it's really great. And the people that usually go into it are awesome and very collegial and friendly. And, you know, we're not just pediatricians, thankfully. We, you know, we're surgeons and we do a lot of great stuff, but, um, you know, just on, on kids. So it's great. Well, th thank you so much again for uh, you know sharing your uh, time and thoughts and, and knowledge and uh, for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. This has been an AUA Inside Tracked podcast brought to you by the Residents and Fellows Committee. Check out the AUA University podcast for weekly episodes on the latest clinical updates and advances in urology. For more information about the AUA and membership, visit auanet.org.